with Avanta Ventures. My name is Denise Cardozo, and I am the Executive Director of Silicon Valley Forum. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Silicon Valley Forum, here's my shameless plug. We are a 38-year-old nonprofit supporting the global startup and technology e ecosystem. So what that means is we create content and organize over 50 programs and events per year, including boot camps, executive programs, conferences, panels, pitch events, office hours, and really so much more. So I encourage you after this program to visit our website at siliconvalleyforum.com to check out all the other great initiatives that we're working on. So today we have six amazing startups disrupting the supply chain and ready to take our virtual stage. But before we get to that, I wanna thank all of you today for joining us. And just a reminder that today's event is being recorded and everyone will remain muted throughout the duration of the program. However, we do encourage you to show our startup some love by using the clap feature and put messages of support in the chat box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Each startup will have four minutes to pitch and then they'll face our fierce investor panel who have five minutes for Q&A and feedback for the startups. Um, so we have three incredible judges who have a keen interest in the startup, in the supply chain and logistic companies. And I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves, beginning with David Lee from Advanta Ventures, which is also our partner company for this program. And we are so incredibly grateful for their support. So David, turn it over to you first. Thanks, Denise. Um, super thrilled to be partnering with Denise and, and her amazing team at uh, Silicon Valley Forum to, to host this event. Um, as a brief intro for those of you joining us for the first time, my name is David. I'm part of the investment team here at Avanta. Uh, Avanta is the venture fund of CSAA, which is one of the insurers within the AAA ecosystem. So roadside assistance, batteries, travel, all that jazz. Uh, we're early stage investors with a strong focus on mobility as well as insure tech. Within mobility, we spend uh, a lot of our time looking at the commercial side of transportation around the movement of goods and the broader supply chain ecosystem. So this pitch event is certainly in an area that we're really excited about and are actively kind of looking to deploy capital in as well. So um, thrilled to be here with you all and super excited to hear from uh, all the great startups that are pitching this afternoon. I guess I'll popcorn it over to Caroline. Great, thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Caroline Duffy. Thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, I am an investor at Construct Capital. We are a one hundred and forty million dollar fund uh, that focuses on investing in innovation in and around foundational industries. And so, we think of that as, you know, those industries that are generating probably 50 plus percent of the US GDP and yet have been you know vastly underinvested in for years if not decades and so we're excited about software applications particularly um, or or software hardware combinations that are innovating in those spaces uh, we invest at the series seed and series a check size is anywhere from you know two to, to eight million um, our kind of core three theses are around manufacturing and distributed manufacturing, supply chain and logistics, uh, and transportation and mobility. So really excited to hear the pitches today. And I'll pass it over to Chelsea. Hi, everyone. Similarly, very excited to be here today. Um, I'm an investor at Equal Ventures. We are a seed stage fund, typically based in New York, $56 million fund. We invest exclusively in the C stage, so typically one to two million dollar checks. And a little bit similar to Caroline, um, our fund is focused on investing in legacy industries and specifically startups looking to disrupt them. So for us, that would be supply chain logistics, retail insurance, care economies, and energy. So definitely really excited to hear all the pitches today, some that I've actually met previously. So excited to hear about new startups and get the update on the ones that I'm already familiar with. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, judges. So we are ready to get started. So let's please welcome our first um, pitch company, Stoke Systems. Uh, 
I hope you can see the screen. Let me know if you can. Yep. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Denise. And thank you for the opportunity to tell you all a little bit about our company. I'm Karthik, I'm the CEO of Stoke. And uh, we have a very simple mission. We want to make it really easy for companies to monitor remote assets. So over the last year or so, all of us have become a little bit more used to uh, working remotely. Um, but that uh, has been quite a bit of a, a challenge for most companies. In fact, monitoring remote assets is just uh, a, a difficult challenge for most companies. Uh, and, and the reason for that is the cost of sensorizing an asset that's in a remote location. Quite often is very expensive and it just doesn't make economic sense. The ROI equation doesn't work out for most uh, use cases. So as a result, many of the remote assets in the world are unmonitored or under-monitored. And that's the uh, problem we are trying to solve uh, with our solution it's called uh, Smart Edge. So it's a simple device, uh, can be installed on a variety of assets. It's uh, very easily sort of links up to our application in the cloud to give you immediate feedback on the condition or the location of the asset. So whether it's a container you're trying to track or the vessel that's carrying the container or the engine that's driving that vessel or the port equipment that loaded the container onto the vessel um, or anything upstream or downstream from there can really be monitored with a simple um, device as, as, as ours. So this is uh, basically how it works. Um, as I said, simple device that can be installed in seconds. Um, you attach that device with a magnet, it stays on the asset, and it quickly determines what the baseline level of movement or vibration is. And from that stand, from that uh, vantage point, it, it can basically detect not just uh, the movement of the, of the asset, uh, but also uh, fairly detailed analytics on vibration. So it can be used on assets such as a pump or a motor, uh, and also to monitor location of a large uh, an asset uh, that moves like a container. So we currently support cellular and Wi-Fi connectivity, and we're planning to add a few more connectivity options. So it's fairly ubiquitous already. So regardless of where the asset is located, you get immediate feedback on the current condition and uh, a predicted uh, risk of failure for, for, uh, for the future. Um, now this uh, is especially uh, important in a complex ecosystem like the supply chain. Now we're currently focused in the upstream uh, area, so in production and inbound logistics, but we have a solution which we believe uh, can be used on multiple applications and multiple uh, asset classes uh, without having to really change any of the underlying uh, software or hardware stack. So it's an end-to-end -end solution that doesn't require a lot of customization. Uh, and uh, it, it really helps us uh, scale as a company and for our customers really easy to deploy and scale. And we offer this as a service. So there's no hardware to buy. Um, there is typically uh, no uh, additional um, installation effort on the part of the customer. It's extremely easy to install, as I mentioned earlier, no infrastructure needed and no CapEx. It's a simple yearly subscription fee per device. And uh, we've been around for less than a year. We're based in San Jose with uh, a small team in India. Uh, we've got six enterprise customers already. So we're doing reasonably well in that, uh, in that area. Uh, we're starting to get a little bit of recognition for the work that we've been doing. And uh, the, the thing I'm, I'm most proud of is we've actually launched two complex hardware platforms in less than a year. Uh, they're both doing really well in the market. We've uh, done extensive testing and we've de-risked the product to a great extent already. Um, we've got a, a solid team in place. Uh, my personal background is in hardware and semiconductors and sensors. Uh, Remy, who handles our business development, uh, Remy and I went to business school together, so we've uh, known each other for a while uh, when we studied in Spain. Um, and then Venki, who uh, handles our engineering, I've uh, known him for over 10 years, worked at a couple of companies together and uh, got a good mix of startup and corporate experience and a good background in uh, bringing solutions to market in the past. So that's Stoke. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. So asset monitoring made really simple. Excellent pitch. Thanks so much. Um, so David, I'm going to go ahead and um, kick the first round of questions off to you first. Yeah. Karthik, thanks for the uh, the intro presentation here. Um, well, one quick question on the types of data. I think you mentioned, it sounds like it's vibration and movement. Any other types of data points? And 
I would love to just understand the anomaly detection side a little bit better in terms of accuracy, any sense of accuracy or, or false positive or negative rates as well. Yeah, um, so today it's vibration and temperature, David. Um, so primarily the temperature is used as a way to improve the accuracy of the, uh, the vibration analytics. So we've got three stacks running on the sensor itself. Uh, we do very, very little in the cloud, uh, if anything, other than just track long-term trends. So all of our analytics are running on the sensor. Uh, so the first is just to determine the asset health trend that you see here on the left that determines the baseline vibration levels and uh, any sort of movement in the green, yellow, or red zones that determines uh, whether we do detailed analytics, which you see on the right here. Here we, we do spectrum analysis. So that's the second layer of analytics that runs on the sensor. And finally, we have a machine learning model that determines the probability of failure that you see here on the top left. So those are the three um, models that are currently running on the sensor. Um, so to get reasonably good feedback from asset health trend and analytics, it just takes a few hours worth of data. So once we get the baseline, we're able to determine that quite easily. The accuracy is well over 90% almost immediately. Um, for the prediction to really get that same level of accuracy, probably needs about two weeks worth of data. Okay, thanks, Caroline. Yeah, um, a great, great pitch. So following up on that a little bit, I'd love to get a better sense of around, you know, when you talk about the actionable insights, you certainly have what what you just walked through and, and described. Um, you know, what are the, the true use cases that you're focused on across the four or so industries that your your customers are in thus far? Yeah, we've got a couple of utilities customers, just to give you an example. Uh, so they're currently monitoring assets by sending a couple of people in a truck to all the remote pump stations to monitor the, the water pumps. Um, so we're replacing that with continuous monitoring uh, using our sensors. So that's a typical use case where you're currently doing uh, manual monitoring and we're, we're sort of converting over to um, sensor-based monitoring. Uh, the other set of use cases are more related to converting a, um, a preventive maintenance strategy to a predictive maintenance strategy. So we have a couple of customers doing uh, going through that transition. So there, uh, the uh, ROI is a little bit more nuanced. I mean, it depends really on the use case and the value of the asset. Uh, but they are trying to figure out if they can prevent unnecessary maintenance or over maintenance of equipment. So we're trying to give analytics such as uh, running hours, utilization. Uh, so a lot of statistics around utilization uh, rates. Uh, and then the, the actual uh, um, smartage analytics that you see here on the bottom right tells you, or gives you a clue as to what may be going wrong, what may be causing the, uh, the spike in the asset health trend. So then they can focus on whether it's a bearing issue or something a little bit more detailed and, and try to get the right type of people over there to do the maintenance. So those are the two, broadly speaking, those two types of analytics are, are most helpful for customers. Got it. And so are you customizing uh, then based on, for each customer, you're kind of customizing the view that they see and what's being measured and monitored? Yeah, th this is the default view. So for 80% for of the customers, they tend to use it as is. And these are customers that uh, basically buy into the entire stack. So they don't have their own digital platform. They basically buy the sensor plus the, um, plus the, the visualization. For customers that have their own digital platform, we provide an API and we push the data into, uh, into their platform uh, in any format that they like. Uh, but the, the basic stack itself is, uh, uh, is not customizable. So it's sold as is off, off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in the cases where it's an API, are you doing translation of, of the data so that it's um, you know, usable based on uh, across many different Yes, yes, we, we do that a little bit. Um, so it really depends on what their uh, data format is. So in some cases, they want something that's running on Azure or AWS, uh, for example, and they need it to be in a certain format. So we just pu push the data into their platform. But it's, it's lightweight at that stage. I mean, we, we really have customization only happening in the application layer. And uh, it's just a matter of pushing the data in a different format. Um, so for us, we are anyway filtering all of that raw data in the front end. So all you, you're actually seeing is, is what you see on the dashboard. So it's pretty simple for us to, uh, to reformat the data at that stage. Got it, thanks. All right, Chelsea, we have just one minute for a quick question from you. 
Yeah, I was trying to make it quick. Um, so first of all, definitely of the space, I think visibility is obviously a really important segment. Um, curious on how strategically you guys are thinking about the initial go to market. And it's like a little bit of extension of Caroline's question. Are you guys thinking to just go broad um, versus going more verticalized within each of the segments you guys mentioned? Just OEM versus mining versus maritime utilities, they are fairly different end markets. So wondering how you guys are thinking about the product roadmap there. Yeah, we were initially looking at uh, at asset verticals or asset classes, Chelsea. So we're looking at pumps, motors, compressors. Um, those are the three most widely used uh, remote assets uh, in, in the whole um, uh, supply chain. And, and it's fairly common across these industries that we are targeting. Um, so we have a solution that works for most rotating equipment at this stage, uh, as well as static assets and, and simple, simpler assets like containers. So um, OEMs are, are particularly interested in integrating our sensors into um, their, their solution. Um, the retrofit market obviously is a larger one, uh, but there's some potential there for us to grow. Um, but the other three industries that are listed here are all fairly similar in the way that they're approaching either preventive maintenance or manual inspections. So um, our target really is to uh, attack this um, in, in different asset classes. Uh, and once we, we get to a point where we have enough penetration in use cases there, then I think we can go horizontal and, and uh, go for different uh, segments within the, the supply chain in this case. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karthik. Um, and share your screen now so we can introduce the next company. All right. So let's please welcome Listing Bird. Hi everyone, Julia McDonald here, a CEO of Listing Board. Please let me know if you cannot see my screen. Um, so Listing Board is essentially an AI inventory sourcing agent. Almost everyone has been following sort of the exponential growth in e-commerce in the news recently, but I don't think a lot of people realize that um, uh, importing goods from global places where they're, in their manufacturers, such as China and India, to those e-commerce merchants and retail merchants uh, into their stores or Amazon FBA as a process really has not changed since Alibaba came around in 1999. So all the merchants, whether they're huge or small, have to undergo this uh, complex process of finding factories where inventory is manufactured, let's say in China, getting in touch with them to assess their quality, negotiate terms, negotiate global payments, arrange air cargo or sea shipping, and then undergo a global customs process, which in any point of this chain can uh, go wrong and uh, takes a lot of time. And if something uh, really doesn't work, then it's extremely expensive and frustrating. Uh, and what we have done at Listing Bird is we have essentially found a way to automate this process end to end with artificial intelligence. Almost every product in China is manufactured by hundreds or thousands or even of factories. So we're building an AI chatbot that will essentially pass the Turing test, will be unrecognizable to factories. It will connect to um, any chat mechanism that the factory uses, from Ali chat to WhatsApp to Telegram, and negotiate all these terms simultaneously with factories to get the best price for each purchase order across uh, across the factory pallet. And then we'll coordinate the communication, the data exchange, the follow-up between shipping agents, factories, testing labs involved, et cetera. What it does is it makes it not only cheaper to source, it makes it much more reliable and makes everything much faster. In terms of our team, we're two co-founders. Uh, my background has been in AI and investment banking. So prior to Listing Bird, I was part of another NLP startup where I built about a $5 million um, business unit and the company was acquired. And then I joined forces with my co-founder and CTO Hussam, who has built two e-commerce businesses from scratch using his own e-commerce optimization tools. And they both scaled to about a million dollars within 12 months. And we joined forces to create Listing Bird and closed just a small pre-seed uh, end of last year. Uh, in terms of our go-to-market roadmap, we are now targeting a sort of bottom-up approach, smallest merchants that need about 50 to 100 units. Uh, those people have the hardest time working with factories directly because they're too small to, to get <laughs> the factory excited about their order and they typically like their education and experience as well. And what it helps us is we are building traction at the same time we're setting our operations. And even more importantly, we're generating conversational data that we can use in parallel to train our chatbots. Next step for us will be small to medium sized customers that have their own established e-commerce stores will be connect with our uh, tool directly into that store and offer it as a SaaS subscription in addition to the sort of margin-based model that we have right now. 
And then last but not least, we have gotten a lot of uh, excitement from enterprise customers who have used procurement departments. You think about like car manufacturers that would like to pay a API call base fee uh, once the chatbot is really much more advanced and can do like complex uh, negotiations, which will be in a few years. As of now, we have um, about $40,000 in goods sold every single month. Uh, we have over 30 customers that keep growing with us. Um, a lot of them purchase every month, well, even every week. Um, they're pretty loyal and love getting their inventory with no problems to their doorstep. We're not only saving them a lot of time, uh, but we're also letting them try new products quickly uh, and uh, that increases their bottom line directly. So thank you very much for your attention. We'd love to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Julia. Um, Chelsea, we're going to start with you first for this one. Yeah, for sure. Um, Julia, just first of all, I love the space. Um, I think like sourcing procurement is super, super interesting within the entire supply chain stack and definitely a ton of pain points there. So we'd love to understand the platform a little bit more. I, I wonder if it's like slide three or four that lays out the actual um, if we go back to that slide, maybe it's three. Uh, sorry, it's four, <laughs> my bad. Uh, you mean this, the goal to market roadmap? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Is our team. yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, three, 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 three then. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah so, so I guess, can you explain the product a little bit more? Is it, is it that it's, large scale AI negotiating with a bunch of different factories. Is there a marketplace component of this eventually where there is an aggregation of manufacturing data? Uh, there is an aggregation of data on our side, but we're not aiming to do it a marketplace where factories uh, sort of come onto our website. The idea is, is to have a sort of inverse stock exchange if you see what I mean that the customer is king and every time the customer orders something there needs to be a competition to fulfill that order so we should be living in a just-in-time world where it's not the customers trying to get some sort of a deal but companies competing to fulfill that order so the customer uh, chooses a white label product it's now on our website and we found a way to automatically load every single white label product right now we have about 500 uh, but then once they choose the white label product it's on to us with our technology to go to all factories that manufacture it and say, hey, we have a purchase order. Who gets us the best deal? Um, and then it's a matter of coordination and, and data exchange from there. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. And your initial customer segment are these like micro merchants who typically would get terrible pricing terms because their MRQs are really low. Um, so I guess initially they there there is no like consolidation of the MOQs, right? It's really just it, a service is. that saves, but there, there is a consolidation of MOQs, okay. Yes, correct. So we actually on our end, uh, in order to offer much better shipping terms that they would get themselves, we're consolidating it through a fulfillment and shipping agent in China, which allows us to like undercut the shipping rates for low MOQ by you know, 70%, uh, which in long-term we will have that also tracked, you know, the products I just took and all sort of coordinated just in time. It's not main component of our business, but it, it delivers a lot of value as well. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then last question for me is how, how did you guys decide which initial products you used to go after? That's a, that's a great question. We actually have sort of a competitive advantage in that because um, my co-founders had a API that was like predicting sales in different platforms, um, Amazon, eBay, it's a separate code base. So we started with a very competitive set of products. You can see it on our website right now, about 500 uh, that we knew are doing well and we complemented it for, for everything that our customers request, especially if it comes from a two, three customers, we're like, okay, this is, this is hot right now and boom, it's on our product. So it's a, it's a iterative cycle. Uh, we are going after two, three categories where we know there's a lot of demand. So that's uh, electronics, that's clothing and makeup and a few other gift areas. And then slowly we expand into like niche categories Staying away from you know stuff that is difficult skincare or things that require medical approvals that, that would be like last. <laughs> Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. All right, David, I'm um, going to turn it over to you. We have about a minute and a half left for this for Q and A portion. So, all right, I'll go quickly so I 
give a Carolina question too. Um, Julia, thanks for the presentation. Um, one quick question in terms of how you reach your customers, right? One of the challenges of going after, you know, this micro segment or SMBs in general is, you know, getting your customer acquisition costs uh, in line to make this profitable. So, so you can talk a little bit about the go-to-market strategy there. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. So right now we have a wholesale store uh, where every product, as I said, is automatically loaded through an extension that we built. And basically we started doing pay-per-clicks. This is something very new as of two weeks ago because uh, the website took so much time and people just find it on Google. They come in and they, it's meant to be fully self-checkout. So even though it's wholesale and there's a lot of attributes, you know, selecting different parameters, uh, five, six, seven, but it's built in such a way it's very intuitive, you know, uh, you, can, you could obviously test it, that people, we have started getting an order about every second day now, uh, where people just come and order, they don't even talk to us. Um, we've been running this for about two weeks. Prior to that, what we did with, uh, you know, obviously we've been getting a lot of sales before that, was just simply to talk to our friends and also talk to places like Facebook, and we say, here's the product, here's the PayPal link, and people are like, okay, I need this, and they pay, and that's it. <laughs> Got it, thank you. And on the factory side, uh, how are you vetting the factories that come on the platform or are then doing the bidding? Right, so co companies are not on a the platform, they're in our back end, obviously. Uh, so initially we try to get a small order with them and, and get it to, you know, we have also uh, side businesses that we can sell it through because my co-founder was on e-commerce side. So we have this another advantage. We try to get an order and see how it goes. Uh, and then it, it's mostly experience based. We are working with micro merchants at the big advantages. They order, you know, 10 units. And if something goes wrong, we're immediately downgrading that factory. So we're going to build like a machine learning model that ranks the factory based on the responsiveness, quality, number of defects, what they do. And that will factor into our negotiations and how advantages, uh, you know, we, we favor a deal with that factory. Got it. All right. Thank you so much, Julia. Great job. Um, so if you can unshare your screen and we will now introduce um, Vesta Smart Packing Packaging. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yep. Yep. Great. Uh, well, well, good evening from London. Uh, thanks for inviting me to attend. Uh, my name is Tom Mowat, uh, CEO and one of the co-founders of Vesta Smart Packaging. Um, we created Vesta to try and find a way to deal with the plastic problem. Uh, the sheer magnitude of it is is still hard to grasp, even when we see all these numbers. Uh, and it's not just environmental, it's, it's economic as well. Packaging, we know, accounts for the largest single block in terms of the, the responsibility for, for generating all this waste. So we started there. It's such a big problem that when we were designing our solution, we knew we had to try and change something structural to, to try and find a way to alter behaviors on, on a global scale. The behavior we then decided to target was shopping uh, and more specifically shopping via the marketplace. The, the indefinite nature of the modern multi-stage hub and spoke supply chain in CPG places a huge requirement, not just for the price of packaging, but also for the longest possible lifetime. So we need to find a different way of supplying the products. We all need to run our lives if, if we're to do away with the need for, you know, structurally driven need for plastics. So Vesta is the, is the technical infrastructure that supports that change. By having packaging managing the ordering for end users, we circumvent what we used to rely on, which was the efficiency of the marketplace. And we provide a proposition for brands who are looking to sell direct. So our solution is three elements, the packages themselves, they're smart, they're connected, they report how full they are each time they're used. Our platform's powered by AI, it individually and personally ac predicts very accurately how soon you're going to run out. Our application provides device management and refill ordering. The three work together to give you end user, a zero effort, zero consideration supply of any product. We work really simply on a uh, default business model. We design and make bespoke Vesta smart packages for brands uh, as part of POC trials. That's where we are today. As these move to scale, 
we license access through our platform uh, with the, op the option for additional sort of value generating data work, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Our packages and our tech is designed to be available for just about any product. Uh, we've designed the tech stack to be applicable very, very broadly. There's some of the ones we've worked with so far, and there's an awful lot I can't show you which are already under development with our clients. Um, my background is I spent about well, nearly 15 years as a data and analytics consultant, worked all over the world. The thing that professionally interests me, if I was you know, using my old hat, about Vesta is the data. For the first time, we can tell manufacturers who's got your product, how much they have left, and how they use it. This is information that they have been lacking, and they lack, have always lacked. The most obvious use cases you, you know, are out here, doing simple direct stuff, marketing, logistics, etc. But what's been fascinating over the last year is our clients come back to us and making recommendations for direct revenue generating and cost saving innovations above and beyond these use cases. So far, we have five major international clients running commercial pilots in the US, UK, Norway and Brazil. Uh, we've been revenue generating for about the last 18 months, and we've grown sevenfold in our first year. We'll grow tenfold at least this year. Our teams made this solution in-house. It's meant we can develop it very rapidly because we understand the whole thing. We can meet the needs of what is, what I think is a new market, um, which is appearing as I've called auto replenishment. There are others in it. We'll talk about them in a bit. Um, I'll jump into the team here. I do not have time to describe them all in detail at all, but I'm very lucky to work with five of the smartest uh, and nicest people I've ever met. Um, each of them have got more than a decade experience in hardware, software development, electronics, engineering, strategy, sales. Uh, we are tailor-made to deliver this solution. We need, um, one of the things we, we believe at Vesta is we need to make a really serious change to the way we do things to avoid ending up with the, the Alan MacArthur Foundation prediction, which is that by 2050, there'll be more weight of plastic in the sea than there will be fish. Um, in order to do this, we can't just rely on goodwill, right? Everybody's shocked about the plastic thing. Everybody wants to do something differently, but are you really gonna change the way you do your shopping without a proper incentive? And so that's what we're looking to develop here. For end users, convenience, the chance to reduce your plastic use, the chance to stop thinking about buying really boring products like detergent. Just bring it to my house before I know I need it is the value proposition we'd like to deliver. For the manufacturers, chance to sell direct, increase margin, repeat sales, customer loyalty, and a game-changing data set, which they've never had access to. So hopefully on both of those sides, we can generate yeah, a chance to do some real change. So we've already validated the technical and commercial viability of the solution. As we're gonna grow, we potentially need to uh, to raise some capital to, to meet commercial level rollout. Um, so we'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Thanks very much, appreciate the uh, attention. Thank you, Tom. That was really a great presentation. Um, we're gonna kick it off to you, um, Caroline. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, a very interesting space. I've been tracking kind of sustainability in and around a, a number of these different areas. So love to, to see your pitch. Um, are you white labeling to the brands? So like is the app and that sort of thing all uh, branded by the brands you're selling to? Yeah, at the moment. We see a potential in the future for, particularly if we start hitting the SME space, for us to then develop a, a different kind of you know, product solution, but at the moment, we're not we're not looking to be a consumer brand particularly. But at the mm -hmm. moment, we're working with big brands and they're branding their packages their way. And the same thing with our app and platform. It's all designed to be very customizable and it's easy to work with. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And then, you know, for the from the delivery perspective, are you or I guess the the brands doing the reverse logistics to pick up these smart containers or are they sending product in different more eco-friendly packaging to then refill in the the smart container it depends which one of them you talk to actually so some some are looking to do 
pick up and drop off. For me, doing pick up in logistics is not a great plan unless it's a very special set of situations. It's one of the reasons that some of the pickup drop-off models I've seen are ludicrously expensive is because simply the fail rate of pickup in logistics is so high. The majority of our customers are having the Vesta device permanently sitting in the home. And when it runs out, it simply asks them to send it a new refill. Uh, where we are able to make the difference from a sustainability perspective is that very short supply chain between orderer and the place they're ordering it from means that manufacturers can explore shorter life packaging. So for example, we're working with a spice company, they're switching from uh, plastic to recycled paper. We worked with feminine hygiene in Brazil, they were able to make a sit well. The, uh, the pandemic's gotten the way, but they are preparing to ditch the outer wrappers on some of their products because they simply don't have to survive as long through the delivery process. Got it, okay, great, thanks. All right, Chelsea. Hey, Tom. Yeah, I uh, agree. Great vision. Definitely think this is going to be a huge problem for future generations. Um, and my question is a little bit similar to Caroline's in that I guess when we look at some of the smart packaging innovations that have happened in the market, a lot of it is geared towards the resale shelf, right? So if you think about it, I, I, I guess curious, is this smart packaging are you guys purely going to go through the DTC channel from the brand's perspective, or is this smart packaging something that I could go to a grocery store and buy off shelf and that would kickstart me being in the loop of, of, of the packaging? To be honest, we're fairly flexible. Um, it's, you know, I'm not putting myself in a position where I'm going to tell my customers who are buying my packaging how to sell the product. If I were to advise them on it, I would say sell, sell the entire thing direct and avoid a retail shelf forever. Some of our more um, adventurous clients are talking completely about retiring the concept of brand from their lines and going to plain green packaging with almost no labeling on it, except for potentially barcodes that will you know, lead you to product information. Uh, others want it very heavily branded and keep it sort of bright and shiny like the retail shelf experience. I think longer term, the fact that we're moving brands from a position of being you need to stand out on a shelf to you are the de facto order for your customer means we'll see a real change in, in the way people are handling, handling pack, packaging real estate. Um, that's something we're interested to watch and we'll meet the requirements of our customers, but it's not something we have a particular sort of strategic vested interest in. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Tom, an additional question for you around the unit economics side would just be curious about the pricing structure, right? So if I buy a bottle of shampoo or detergent for $5, you know, how much of that goes to the packaging side to you? And also curious about if you have a sense of the revenue gain that brands can realize from the refill and the subscription side and you know that more direct relationship with the consumer. Yeah, sure. So the, the basic economics usually work out that the marketplace fee, either supermarket or your Amazon equivalent will take between 30 to 40% re recommended retail price. You can expect a further five to 10% in wholesale and trade spend adjustments. So if we're being simple about it, let's say half of the price is usually going to the the sales channel that we're looking to circumvent and that's the the upside for our clients now the downside for our clients is they're then paying for the delivery costs and they're also paying me um, so where we the way we help them decide whether this makes sense from an economics perspective is is the cost of my platform fee plus the amortized cost of the lifetime of my packages which are designed to last about 20 years and be refilled literally hundreds and hundreds of times um, and the repeat purchase upside, you know, which one is larger? Um, what we found so far is that even in the most extreme cases where the unit refill price is low the, and the refill frequency is high and the cost of the logistics is high, which it is in Sao Paulo, um, we're still looking net margin even. As soon as you know, refill prices go to five to $7, um, we're seeing fairly significant net margin increases in all the models we've, we've done with our clients. So it looks very, very strong economically for them. Got it. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Tom. That was great. Pleasure. Thank you all very much. Uh, okay. Do you need me to stop sharing? Yes. <laughs> Just hang the uh, email address out for another second. Excellent. So we're going to um, welcome our next company then. Please welcome Juan from HELP. You're on mute, Juan. The best word for 2020. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Juan Gutierrez. I am the CEO and founder of HELP. HELP is a last mile delivery software for Latin America. Oh, something wrong with this. Okay, here we go. Uh, thank you for, thanks for, uh, thanks to Amazon and Walmart. Uh, the new normal in 2021 is same day delivery. The new consumers generations are demanding same day delivery and they're willing to pay more for this service. So what's wrong with this problem? Um, small players, including mom and pop retailers or vendors uh, need an affordable solution for same day deliveries. And they also need to upgrade the IT systems in order to have a clip to chip option so solution. That's why we create HELP. HELP, uh, the last mile delivery fleet management for retailers that operate their own fleets or for local couriers. We connect all drivers in one platform, private fleets, local couriers, and national three-party logistics. We have advanced route optimization, automatic dispatching, real-time reporting, and analytics in one place. We also have apps for drivers and for customers. We can, we're able to connect to any e-commerce, legacy platforms, ERPs, CRMs, or any inventory system to dispatch same day deliveries. We have SMS notifications, real-time uh, driver tracking, live ATAs, navigations, proof of delivery and feedback collection. Our software can be easily adapted to different verticals, food delivery, pharmacy deliveries, e-commerce, service technicians, towing trucks, ambulance, any on-demand service, we can go to that vertical. The market opportunity is big. The global same-day delivery market is growing 50% annually. By 2026, it represents $132 million. $132,000 million. The competitions, there is a lot of last mile softwares, some in Europe, some in North America, but no one is focused in Latin America. And with approach is different. We want to sell this software, but at the same time, we are creating a network of local couriers. We offer wide label solutions. We are the only one that courier aggregator for on-demand companies. And we don't have Commission sphere as others. Our traction, currently we have 1 million deliveries, deliveries per month and we are on track to process 12 million deliveries this year in 2021. We have one of the, one, the biggest pharmacy chains in Mexico with 2000 drivers using our software. And we have the biggest uh, telecommunications courier, uh, Telcel, using our platform for e-commerce. We start in 2015, self-funding company, completely bootstrapping. Actually, this is the first pitch in five years. And by in 2020, we were in cash flow positive and we are only focused in enterprise accounts. By 2022, using the technology that we have developed for enterprise, we want to go to the small and medium business so everybody can uh, self-serve platform SaaS. By 2026, we want to create a network of 5,000 uh, business using our platform. Our business is very simple. We are a B2B SaaS business and we have uh, one pricing for a small business, $100 a month, 2,000 deliveries include. And for enterprise, we can charge through $5, uh, sorry, five cents per delivery 
using the SaaS software or API. Uh, my co-founders, we have 10 years working together in the BPO industry. My co-founder, Felipe, he's an ex-Accenture consulting guy for 10 years. Uh, Josh, uh, he's a senior developer, and he is the founder of the Google Developer Group in Tijuana, Mexico. And I have 15 years experience in the BPO industry. I have two exits selling call centers. What are we asking? We're asking a seed round of $3.5 million to help us uh, to build the largest uh, network delivery for same day in Latin America. Thank you. Thanks so much, Juan. Um, so David, I'm going to start with you this time. Awesome, uh, great presentation, Juan. Great to meet you. Um, a question on the systems in the back end side of things, you know, many of these large courier networks kind of run their own back end systems, right? Whether it's TMS, ERP, warehouse management, all of those things. So I'm curious if you sit on top of those systems, how do you how do you work with them? Do you integrate uh, with these different platforms? Yes, we are connecting to through APIs. Uh, some of these larger uh, third party deliveries like DoorDash or uh, uh, Postmates in the US, they have their own uh, API. So we we do all the calculations of the routing in or end, and we ask for a, or a driver from them. In Latin America, there's a lot of uh, on-demand uh, companies. They have technology, and we connect to them to technology. But our main focus, too, is they exist more than 30,000 uh, local couriers. They don't use technology in, in Latin America. So when they don't have technology, we provide all the technology, and we connect them to the, our network. Got it. And, and in terms of the, the per delivery fee, uh, that you mentioned, I think it was 10 cents or so. it was pretty cheap, right? So I assume that's the fee that goes to help. And on top of that, the enterprise of SMB pays the couriers, whatever the, kind of their, their fee is. Yes, we don't make money on the, on the fees of the deliveries. We get a, a revenue partnership. We get another 10 cents from the uh, delivery companies, uh, but we have a gross margin of 70% with 10 yeah. cents. Got it. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, Chelsea. Hi, great to meet you. Love the pitch. Um, Hello. I yeah, I think it's a super interesting concept. Um, it's like a similar company in the U.S. called OneRail is doing really well right now as well. Um, so I think definitely. The, the business model makes a ton of sense. Wondering if there is an initial prioritization from a product category perspective, I definitely agree that a lot of product categories make sense for same day delivery, but wondering for the initial go to market, are there certain in markets you're targeting where the SLAs make a little bit more sense in the beginning? Yeah, we just, um, we're, right now we are, have 20 small business that we test in. Uh, uh, for us, it's very helpful for the food delivery industry, more in Spain, UK, and Italy, because now the labor laws in that countries, they are pushing companies to hire their own drivers. So we are testing food delivery a lot, and we have pharmacy chains. Uh, I think it could be the main uh, verticals that we can grow easily and quickly. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you. All right, Carolyn. Um, so how are you today, you know, with the companies that you're working with, what's your sales motion? We only focus on, on enterprise accounts. So basically I look at them and, and in Latin America is very common. You have your own drivers, motorcycles. Um, a lot of these companies, they have uh, their own motorcycles and they don't have technology to deliver. So that's why we focus only for the first years in this kind of companies. So when they can, the pandemic came, these companies, they find out the current fleet, private fleet, they don't have enough drivers. So they ask, hey Juan, can we connect with a third party when I have an overflow or uh, I need to overflow some to a uh, third party. That's why we start talking with uh, local providers and national providers 
to send the overflow through an API. I don't know mm -hmm. if I answered your question. Got it. Yeah, I, I was just curious for the enterprise, how you're closing those kind of enterprise companies for for sales. Um, yeah, well, well, reaching out directly. A or? little bit. Yeah, sorry about that. A little background about me. I own and operate and I sell uh, three call centers in the industry. And pretty much all my clients in the call center are enterprise. So I have the connections there, but actually hell born because back in 2015, I was reading a magazine and they mentioned that the next three industries coming to disappear is uh, call centers because the AI. So we start thinking, well, what are we gonna do? So we start uh, making research on the call center and we find out 30% of the calls that we receive in the call center are coming from complaints about customer in the last mile. Where is my driver? Where is the package? I need to return it. So that's where we start with the a, with a help. And we, I personally start selling this to my call center clients. I already sold the, the, the call center, but all these enterprise know us uh, as a partner of the technology partner. So that's what I can get to the enterprise. Got it. Okay. And what percent of the market would you say has their own courier force today? Yeah, uh, it's around 5 million companies. 1 million companies are doing deliveries and at least 20% of those, the, these million, in, uh, only in Mexico, they're doing their own deliveries. The, okay. the short question is 200,000 companies. Got it. Okay, thanks. Thank you Thank so you. much, Juan. That was a great presentation. That was my first time. I'm kind of nervous. But... <laughs> you did great. In fact, if I were to give an award for the most improved from the first time that I heard your pitch, you, you, yeah, you yeah. nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. Let me stop training my screen. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So next up is throughput AI. Can you hear me or? Yep, we can hear you. Well, greetings from Boulder and thanks for putting on this event. Uh, my name is Ali Reza, I'm the founder of Throughput. And what we do is we put the world's material flow on autopilot. Uh, it's a very simple concept, right? We have enough demand data sitting today that you can actually send signals back in time Um, Ollie, we, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. To uh, reorient the supply chain. So the classic example is the Suez Canal. Uh, just a bit of update. No, I'm not, I'm on, I'm on. Okay, I think you're just a little delayed. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Sorry about that. Um, are you guys able to hear me? Okay, so I'm calling in from my cell phone, but I'm presenting on my screen. Then my coffee house. And older, just meeting someone here. So to date, I've been around since 2017, helping industrial companies, primarily CEOs, improve working capital and capex decisions. Our investors include the likes of executives at big supply chain companies, supply chain tech entrepreneurs. You get it, and the who's who in the industrial world. A solid team. My background is I've been everything from a you know operator on the field for slumber day to a geo market manager, and over the years we've. Had she rounded out the team to be uh, very uh, diverse in terms of AI expertise, operations, and how to do sales in this space. Uh, what do we focus on? We focus on optimizing the material management problem. Uh, if you think about the $90 trillion global economy where you're making and moving stuff, today, narrow AI can actually look at the data and figure out what you Underordering, overordering, overproducing, over understocking, and overspending the problem. Uh, what we do differently is on point based solutions, right? They uh, are looking at, uh, say, putting a robot in manufacturing or something in distribution. Well, if you just focus on one part of the supply chain, you end up creating stockpiles before or after that point. What we realize is there's enough demand data downstream that you can actually influence where operations need to run, right? And improve the supply chain. 
And what you really need to do with the global scale now is you need to leverage the existing data and your existing teams and give them a software they can actually optimize at a multi-factory and a multi-supply chain level to give them the operational metrics that they're looking for, which is better output, less inventory problems, and better profitability. Now, in the physical world, nothing has changed for the last thousand years, right? Your customers want stuff on time in full, and you want to make money in return. And this is pretty much the lay of the land, right? Which is you have people optimizing at the machine level, people optimizing at the warehouse level, and all the way up to corporate strategy where I ended up as Lumberjay. Now, what's happened in the last several decades is uh, software and automation providers have come forward and said, you need efficiencies, you need money, all these different systems that are different islands. And what it's also done is it's created In, uh, different sets of metrics that are driving different metrics. You don't have an alignment or the latest wave that's hit uh, Silicon Valley and the rest of the world is end-to-end -end visibility, which is companies have come forward and said, well, let's connect everything and that's going to solve the problems. What happens is when you connect everything, end-to-end -end visibility doesn't actually solve the flow problem. Now you can see everything. Someone still has to go in and actually solve the problem. We took a step above that and said, well, you have enough data today to figure out downstream what you're selling, right? And if you can figure out what you're actually selling, you can tie it to the bottlenecks within your operations and only make stuff that actually sells, right? And when you do that in the short term, at a global level, you solve the working capital problem because you are only making stuff in places that you have to sell. And you actually uh, figure out what the refill rates need to be. So what we need to do as just in the supply chain space is to think of supply chains more as supply strings or, or springs, right? Which is how can they expand and contract and how can we use AI to manage that, how, how much that can uh, you know, contract and expand by. Um, we keep it very modular, right? So we, the way we enter uh, markets is no factory. You have to tie it to finance, right? And that's what we do really successfully. Our deployment times are less than three months now, right? We don't have to set up a data lake and a, and a warehouse and all that and figure out what we get in 15 to 20 months, right? With these uh, IVP systems. Within three months, we can actually validate on the ground level with the buyer and the production supervisors what the impact is. Um, simple model, right? We come in in a pilot, do a budget for three months, get the validation. Once we get the ROI, then we sell at an annual fee, uh, flat fee rate or a lower fee plus a revenue share model. A lot of success during COVID primarily focused on food distribution and plastics. That's been our strategy to expand into upstream and downstream customers. Uh, we've grown 3,600% during uh, COVID alone. Uh, in Q1 already, we've, we've already cleared the, uh, the, the milestone of six digits for U US dollars per account. And this is pretty much our, our financial projections, right? So. Um, what we need to do now is sell to 200 to 400 chief operating officers at a quarter million to half a million dollars a year. And within six years, we believe we would get to the point where UiPath took 13 years to get to because we are tying the demand data to the actual bottlenecks. So that's where we are. We're looking for a Series A lead. Uh, we have about 10 to 15 million circled in follow on capital. And I'd like to thank you for your time and I would be open to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ali. Um, Carolyn, I'm going to turn this over to you to kick the first line of questioning off. Great. Um, so Ali, I have to say it was a little bit choppy uh, audio wise there. So forgive me. Um, I might not have have caught everything that you were saying. I'd love to hear just a little bit more about your traction to date. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So instead, in, in the first quarter, we already cleared the the, the six digits per account value and materials manufacturing. And so uh, um, that's what our traction is, right? In terms of like, looking for a series on pipeline, we have about a $20 million pipeline that uh, I, as a sales uh, founder, am actually servicing right now with one other salesperson. Got it. And so what, what is that over like how many customers and, and whatnot? I can share that in, in detail on a, another call if you'd like, but uh, if you look at us, uh, we have, uh, you know, 
our, our model was when we were developing the software, we were working with 40 customers, right? Uh, 12 of them ended up paying. And seven of those guys are now in that stage where it's at the CEO level and it's looking to move to production, right? Some of them are already, like, we had a call with one of the CFOs and you know, there's already like a 30K per month tail on some of those contracts, right? So that's where we are as a company. Um, but so far it's just been angel funded, no easy money today. Got it, thanks. All right, um, David. Hey, Ali. Um, quick question here. Uh, I think the approach here is quite interesting. I'm curious how you think about your competitive landscape and uh, your barriers to entry. Yeah, absolutely. So we end up uh, we sell to chief operating officers, right, and CFOs, and most of the people are trying to sell to the CIOs. Think of the process analytics firms, right? They're trying to layer on top of SAP, but they're trying to automate the analytics layer for the data data scientists and the strategy people, right? What we're doing is we're going in and saying, look, right, and say, if we saved you this much inventory, uh, we can either charge fat, flat fee, which is within your budget. Or we can do a revenue secure amount model. So uh, pretty unique where we'll go in and we'll get the first pilot or the validation done. Then you're in a major supply chain for a big Fortune 500. Then we go downstream and say, okay, of that customer uh, to say like the supermarket, right? And then we sell the same, uh, you know, uh, use case to the, the most downstream customer. Then the, the target customer that we want, we're basically cornering them on the tier one side and on the and their customer side. And we basically say that, look, you guys are essentially from the data bottleneck right now. Um, so why wouldn't you use our software? Because we know who's supplying to you and we know who you're supplying to. And so that's how we end up selling. That's our go-to-market, how we do one-to-many. Got it, makes sense. Thank you. Chelsea, excuse me, Chelsea, if you have any kind of feedback, just really quick, because we have just 30 seconds left on this. Yep, really quick. Hey, Ollie, good to see you again. Um, great to see the progress. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what are some strategies you've seen work to better accelerate the sales market recently? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Chelsea, we've been working on training up our channel partners, right? Now, the channel partners have been looking at us uh, work for the last, last nine to 12 months, right? They've gotten us data sets internationally when we couldn't penetrate the same company in the US, right? So it's faster validation to use a, a tool like throughput internationally and bring it back to the parent company in the US. And so that's really helped us. What's also helped is a lot of these channel partners are tied to family office money that end up just, you know, giving the tip and say, you know, some Latin American countries saying, hey, we're working with throughput, we see the validation. Do you want to write a half a million dollar check or something, right? And so that's how we are fueling this, right? Um, it's just uh, the channel have so many, uh, they have once, and it's localized in their language up along. And in the meantime, I want to also their companies get it, or they raise you know, millions of dollars themselves. And um, they're pretty much opening up their networks as well. So I think that's been the most. Effective uh, for the last three or four months. Yeah, I, I think I caught most of that. So that's great to hear. Yeah, congrats on the progress. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, if you could unshare your screen now, we have our final company pitching. So please welcome Via Delivery. Hey, just give me a second. I'll turn on my screen sharing. The last not, but not the least, right? Okay. <laughs> so I'm Mitchell. I am a CEO founder of Via Delivery and we are SaaS enabled B2B logistics marketplace. And simply saying we cut shipping costs at least by 80%. And I think like I saw some of you a few months ago. So my uh, feedback would be like an update as well. Uh, so yeah, let's go through that one. Now in nine months from launch, we had our traction of like about 2 million uh, gross merchandise value and 600 KRR. As for now, we like in a few months after that, we get to almost 3 million gross merchandise value and uh, over 1 million ARR at that point. And the problem we are so still solving is very simple right so you go to non-amazon non online stores and you want to buy something like for 3.99 and you are sometimes to pay like six or eight dollars to ship this item 
Uh, now, this is not a small problem, in fact, because like most of the e-commerce market in the United States is uh, like uh, non-Amazon market. D2C brands, online stores, etc. And the main reason for shopping carts to be abandoned in those non-Amazon online stores is the high shipping cost. That leads to, well, roughly 160 billion of losses for the industry in the United States alone. Uh, while online shoppers, they are kind of disappointed, disappointed as well, right? Because what they do, they just waste their time to get to expensive shipping. Uh, what we do, we add this extra shipping option, which is uh, like to pick up your parcel from uh, on a register in a convenience store, grocery, pharmacy, gas station in your neighborhood and pay just one, like from one to two dollars for shipping instead of spending six or eight. And the way we reduced cost low enough to like make it sustainable is very simple and tricky at the same time. So if you go to CVS Health nearby and grab a pack of milk from their shelf, which could probably cost $3.99 as well. Well, the cost of shipping of this pack of milk would only be 11 cents. That includes distribution centers, line holes, etc. So by piggybacking off of the existing brick and mortar retail distribution networks and warehouses, wire delivery actually enables this 11 cent shipping for entire e-commerce. And by doing that, we avoid this like UPS, USPS and FedEx along this shipping process. And uh, we also know that there's extra revenue for our brick and mortar partners that comes from the fact that, that this extra food traffic actually converts to more sales. Uh, well, you definitely know that e-commerce is booming in 2020. In fact, few people know that buy online, pick up and store is actually going through the roof, like five times the growth of e-commerce. And for some major retailers in the United States, this buy online, pick up and store format already like corresponds to more than 45% of all online sales. And when they started to like understand why it happens, well, price matters. And what we do from user's perspective, well, we now enable this buy online pickup and store to all D2C brands, to all mamas and papas stores and uh, all these guys. And by doing that, we actually increase their sales. Well, the idea of wire delivery was not our idea as, a, uh, as a founders. We get it from our clients from our previous startup, which was meal kit delivery. And one year ago, it was on, like only two of us, me and Olga, and uh, we had like this experience in e-commerce. Before that, I owned logistics company. And now it's more like than like 25 people full-time in the team, plus great customer advisory board, including uh, vice president of Target, senior vice president of CVS, uh, ex-chief supply chain officer from Bed Bath & Beyond, etc. We have even a guy who is a head of product delivery from Amazon. Uh, in our customer advisory board. And as eight months from launch, we made it to 14K uh, locations. Now we are already like almost 20,000 locations hit in five countries, probably 10 time zones or 12 already. And the reason we are growing that fast is as simple as that. Like for last decade, e-commerce was growing. And by the same time, brick and mortar retailers, they were losing their sales. And COVID just speed up all those trends. Now we have a solution for brick and mortar uh, retailers to like bring this traffic back to the stores and get like these sales back. And as for e-commerce, we have this like most cost-effective shipping option on the market. And overall, we say that by bridging this gap between pure play e-commerce and brick and mortar retailers, we help our partners to lead the major shift that is happening on the market right now. That's pretty much about us. All right, thank you so much. Um, Carolyn, do you wanna start this, start us off? Yeah, um, so totally agree on kind of the, the change that e-commerce will, will bring across a number of different industries, but particularly as it relates to, to supply chain. Um, where have you started geographically? We started it in Russia, like, 10 months ago and then relocated to Bay Area ourselves in August 2020. We used to say like we've been among few startups who came to Bay Area when everyone else was leaving Bay Area. <laughs> uh, yeah, now we have like about 200 locations in the United States, uh, East Coast, West Coast, a little bit Texas, Chicago, and uh, signing this major agreement with CVS uh, Health for 6,500 locations. Also talking to Walmart, Sam's Club, this kind of guys. Got it. Okay. And what is the actual experience for um, the end customer in terms of picking up their 
their goods? So you just go to like a website that where you have like this alternative delivery location option, click on that one. And yeah, after that, you, you just wait for wire delivery notification. And once it's there, it says, hey, you can come to the location you've chosen, say like a C store nearby, right? Or a gas station nearby. And you go there, you go to the register and say, hey, you got this parcel for me. And they give you the parcel, they check the secret code. And by the way, you are welcome to buy something else like snacks. Etc. So that's that's the process itself, and by mm -hmm. doing that, we actually help with the Porsche piracy as well a lot, because yeah, like there's a segment of expensive items that you don't want to be just dropped out there uh, and wait for you like for a few hours, like your new iPhone, right? So we solve this problem as well. Mm, got it. Okay, and so you know, from a, a storage perspective, is there a window for how much time you have to? pick something up? How do you manage kind of the inventory turn on the side of CVS or a gas station that has, you know, limited? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. And that's that's the first question we asked from brick and mortar location, like any of them we are talking about. Uh, how, how bulky are those items? So we start with saying like, hey, we don't ship like washing machines, freezers, etc. So you may not expect this to come to your stores. But all the rest, we ask you how much space you have. Now we add this like uh, available space to our database and we know dimensions of every single parcel. So once we know you are full, then okay, we like uh, uh, for a time being we exclude you from the map of locations available. And usually we store parcels like up to five days, and after that they go like back to distribution centers. Got it. Okay, thanks, David. Yeah, Mitchell, great to see you again, and yeah, uh, great, great to see great the to progress see you you've made. Uh, Oh, one of the areas that lots of sellers struggle with is also the reverse logistics side. Can your network be kind of leveraged for that component of things as well? Yeah, it does. It does. Because like, it's, I would say it's even easier because uh, if we are talking about like grocery stores or C stores that are uh, supplied from distribution centers, right? Those truck goes uh, to C stores usually being full on 80%, 80 to 85%, but on their way back, they are empty by like 90% of the space at least. So this space is available for reverse logistics, which is like returns. And we solve it as well. Now, uh, we, we launched it in the uh, Russian market already. So we will add it in the United States as well later on. But yeah, it's even easier for us to do. And we do like these even discounts for these returns comparing to the rates we have for actual pickups. Mm -hmm. Got it. And one more question, Mitchell. How do you think about kind of the density requirement here as it relates to different markets or from a geographical perspective? Well, I would say that this example of one of the major retailers in the United States, just like the data they provide me in person. So uh, this like uh, network, they used to ten, have like their stores 10 to 15 minutes drive from, from any location and still 45% of all the like online shoppers, they prefer to drive somewhere just to get a cut on shipping costs, right? So that, that's kind of a benchmark. On uh, like more developed uh, markets, we have our time of walk, walking distance sometimes for 10 minutes, something. So I think like five to 10 minutes drive is pretty acceptable for, for most of the territory. And I mean, like urban could be like walking distance. Suburban, that's fine to have like 10 minutes drive distance. For rural areas, well, that's a little bit more, but these are like more linked to gas stations around. So it's uh, this like time of travel actually links to your habits. And the way you would, okay, you would still go to this gas station once, once a week or several times a week. So that's, that's what we have. Got it, thank you. Yeah. I'll say we have just about 30 seconds left if you have, you know, a quick question for Mitchell. Yeah, just one question for you, Mitchell, and good to see you again. Um, yeah. Great to hear on the CBS partnership. That's definitely huge. Wondering what the game plan is from the pure play e-com side, um, from like a go-to-market perspective, thinking in partnerships, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, we recently get into negotiation with uh, Mattel, you know, this toy producer, Barbie, Hot Wheels, uh, these kind of guys. And I heard this uh, like supplement. So we, uh, in our home market, we get like this uh, from small mamas and papas to top approach. While 
in the United States, we, we lean towards like this medium to large size clients from the very beginning, because the market in the United States states for alternative delivery locations is pretty empty these days. So it's a perfect time for us to disrupt. Thus, probably all those like bigger plays react in a better way. And we just promote ourselves. Hey, we are this like buy online pickup and store option for D2C brands. And that's what you don't have in the market at all right now. And that's what we you now have in buy delivery. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Yeah. I mean, really, all the pitching companies today, you guys all did, you know, really a wonderful job. And I think I speak for, you know, the, the Silicon Valley Forum team as well as all the investors here that we really look forward to following, you know, all of you on your journey. Um, so, David, um, I think I mentioned this to you before, you know, before we end this program. Um, I do have a quick question um, for you know the investor panel. So um, so COVID nineteen has obviously put some significant challenges on the supply chain. Um, some interest, under, industries obviously have been hit harder than others. Um, we know that enterprises are now starting to rethink their supply chain strategies and also you know thinking about investing heavily in new technologies. So with all that, I'm curious as to what you all think are the big changes and trends that you see coming. I'm happy, to, <laughs> I'm happy to start um, and then Chelsea, Caroline, please add. Uh, I think one of the big areas that we're kind of excited about is what I like to think of as kind of actionable visibility. Um, I think for years, maybe decades, shippers and logistics service providers have talked about the concept of visibility in terms of understanding in real time where products are from end to end, when it, from when it leaves the warehouse all the way to when it reaches the customers. And of course you have kind of the entire supply chain around the raw materials side before that. Um, but I think what COVID and all of the supply chain disruptions that we've seen from stores running out of toilet paper to the ever given stopping traffic in the Suez for uh, a while, what all of that highlights um, is the fact that just understanding where your products are dots on a map in some sense is may not actually be enough. Uh, it's actually being able to take that visibility and to really leverage that to make sense of and, and to manage right the downstream impacts of those disruptions that matter. So, you know, not only understanding that there's a jam in the Suez, but to kind of go one step further. Right, and to say, you know, what can I be doing to help you manage that? Right, so integrating into the ERP systems or the warehouse management systems, you know, I can maybe help you understand how to adapt your staffing needs as a result of this delay, or you know, it can be automated exception handling, whereby if I understand um, from that visibility, there's a delay of X duration for Y value of goods, I can actually automatically help you reroute, right, and choose a different port or a transportation mod modality. And I think what all that starts to do is it takes a complex supply chain and makes it actually more resilient, both to supply and the demand shops. And so, you know, uh, and I think we've seen a lot of that, right, in the past year. So that's one of the, the trends and the areas that we're quite excited about and are seeing a lot of interesting um, and exciting businesses start to tackle some of those challenges as well. Yeah, a couple of um, things that that come to mind, particularly as I've talked to a number of manufacturers in the space and, and that sort of thing. I think one is the need to diversify supply chains in order to drive that resilience. So, you know, looking for new partners, new manufacturers um, that can be available and and reliable, um, whether that's geographic diversification, you know, partner diversification, just in terms of numbers, and those sorts of things. I, I think something that that goes hand in hand with is a sense of more distributed manufacturing. So looking to go closer to the end customer for either the creation of a good, uh, or at least for kind of the end. Um, you know, the end uh, assembly of a, a good or some sort. So, you know, practically what we're seeing from a U.S. perspective is thinking about nor more reshoring, more nearshoring. And then from that as well comes the need to 
get to some sort of price parity with automation, robotics, that sort of thing. So they're all kind of uh, weaving together, but I think ultimately move towards, you know, more, more resiliency from a supply chain perspective. Yeah, totally agree with um, what Dave and Caroline both said. I think like visibility, resilience, and flexibility are kind of like the buzzwords of supply chain this year, as they should be. Um, I think just one more thing to add is this importance of network level connectivity. So like really understanding that you need to move from above point systems into being able to see your entire supply chain network and understanding how something in the Suez affects how, like when your customers get their product like four, four weeks, six weeks from now. So I think it's even the importance of like sm smaller brands who weren't as sophisticated in thinking about the supply chain, realizing that, hey, this is like really, really critical pain point for me to be thinking about now. So I do think we are seeing more SMBs really put a focus on investing in their supply chain, whether it's from just a software perspective or an actual asset perspective. Well, thank you for that. And um, all right. Well, I mean, we thank all of you, um, all our pitch judges for joining us today. Um, it was an incredible honor for you, ha for you to have you here and to donate your time to um, this program. Um, thank you to our wonderful partners at Avanta Ventures. And thanks to all of you and our audience who, who participated today and supported this event. And of course, to all our wonderful pitch companies. So thank you and um, hope everyone has a great rest, rest of the week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.